Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center and the Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled The Mythology of the Lost Cause. I'm very pleased to be joined by Caroline Janney. She's the now professor in history of American Civil War and the director of the now Center for Civil War History at the University of Virginia. Today is September 21st, 2021. On behalf of my colleagues, Jira and Mike and Meredith, I'd like to welcome you uh, back to the, the series and the, um, and the webinar sessions. Uh, my name is Andy Mink. I'm vice president of education at the center. Um, I noticed tonight that we've got uh, a, a very wide uh, landscape of participants who have joined us, and it's always great to see. In particular, I want to note that uh, Conrad and Pamela are joining us from New Mexico. Uh, it's always great to see Joel, who's here from Central Illinois, and it looks like Mary from Connecticut, Rhonda from Athens, Wisconsin, and John from Michigan have also joined us. Um, I want to particularly note the community college uh, instructors with us tonight. Katrina is here from Tompkins Cortland Community College in New York. Amy is here from Eastern Iowa Community College. It's great to have both of you with us. And I see somewhere in the room is uh, Abigail. Abigail's representing the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, one of our partners in our digital library. It's always great to see uh, uh, members of their staff, Abigail, Heather, others uh, who can join us for these events. Um, and as always, we've got a lot of folks from Los Angeles with us. Uh, Enrique slid in right as the registration closed. It's great to see uh, Enrique here in the back of the room. And Sabrina, it's nice to see you here with us as well. Uh, the National Humanities Center uh, since 1978 has been, has been constructing narratives around the world we live in, around the identity that we have as individuals and the communities we live in uh, through a wide variety of disciplines. And I suspect that one way to, to think about the work that's done uh, by all of our fellows, all of the scholars who come in residence and who uh, in some way particip participate in the work we do is to imagine that, that that narrative that they're constructing and interpreting and un uh, uncovering is all very evidence-based. You know, we, we live in a world now, it seems, where uh, expertise is being uh, marginalized, where long, um, very intense professional training to become experts in a field. And by the way, that includes all of you who stand in front of, in front of younger students on a daily basis and teach. But that there's some, some sense that expertise doesn't have the same value and the same currency. And I think one of the things that uh, I, I bet we're going to highlight tonight is the ways in which understanding ourselves, understanding the past, understanding how the past speaks to our present is all done in a constructed, evidence-based inquiry approach where where new and emerging understandings are coming forth regularly, but we don't just make stuff up. We don't just say things because uh, because it backfills some uh, some story that we want to tell. But rather, there's very clear document-based, uh, source-based, evidence-based ways to approach that. And one of the things that I encourage you to think about doing is um, is replicating that and giving your students a chance to investigate the past through that same process. One of the places that you can find resources to do that is in our Open Education Resource Digital Library. Uh, this resource uh, bank provides free and open access to a wide variety of scholarly and instructional materials. This is also where you're going to find any materials associated with tonight's uh, webinar series. So be sure you sign up for the group, and that'll give you full access to the folder where uh, Professor Janney's uh, readings are for tonight, where the recordings after the webinar is completed, have been housed and stored, and you can access them easily. And I would encourage you to take a look at these resources because this is where you know you can get accurate, vetted, scholarly-based work that you can then embed in your curriculum and your instruction and make available for your students. Our webinar series gives uh, lots of examples, I think, of how uh, professional historians and scholars in a wide variety of fields go about the process of their work. Part of what we hope to do is make visible that process um, if, for example, you uh, work a lot with primary sources in your classroom, and I'm seeing many of you uh, share and illustrate examples of that in the chat box, you may be very interested in the, uh, the session on October 5th with Martha Seinwiss uh, from Princeton on teaching with photographs. But I'd also encourage you to look through the whole uh, wide scope of our webinars this year, uh, The World of Plymouth Plantation with Carla Pastana from UCLA, Southern Journey, The Migrations of the American South with Ed Ayers, and the misquoted Lincoln, which I believe the Abraham uh, Lincoln Presidential Library will be joining us for with Kate Mazur uh, from Northwestern, will all give very specific ways to use primary sources in research and scholarship and by extension in your teaching. I think it's more than just giving resources to your kids, though. 
Uh, all of you have had this experience of providing a primary source document of some kind, and your students likely look at it and ask you what they're supposed to do. They don't necessarily know the process of interrogating in a thoughtful, purposeful way a primary source document. I'm very pleased to, uh, to share this announcement for an upcoming virtual program on October 23rd. We're partnering with the Harvard Business School uh, to share a, um, a Saturday immersive experience on the Case Method Institute. Uh, case Method is actually a process of interrogation and questioning that was first developed in professional schools, but Harvard Business Professor David Moss, who actually led a webinar with us several years ago, uh, has applied this to a wide variety of case studies in law uh, that track the history of American democracy. Each one of our webinars earns you five professional credit hours. This free uh, workshop will earn you 20 professional credit hours. So if you teach at the upper middle school and high school level, if you have a strong interest and or you're teaching history, government, civics, uh, then I would highly encourage you to sign up. You can find the link in on our website. I'll also drop it in the chat box uh, momentarily. I also want to thank our Teacher Advisory Council for all of the hard work that they do on our behalf. Uh, each year we select about 20. This year we have 21 educators from all across the country, and they are our lifeline. They, they let us know how uh, life in the classroom is, the uh, kinds of curriculum gaps and needs are emerging, uh, it's our intention to very much support their professional leadership and growth, and in return, they give us an awful lot of support to make sure that the work we do on your behalf is relevant and valuable. Uh, tonight's webinar will be an audio-only webinar. However, your participation is still very important. There's an audience chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and that's where you can chat with each other, share links, ask questions uh, of each other, make comments. Just above that, there's an Ask Professor Janney box, and that's where you can submit formal questions for the talk tonight. As the moderator, I'll bring those forward when the time makes uh, sense, when you know maybe we'll pause for a moment and try to clarify some things, but we very much want to hear your thoughts. We want to hear your, um, your, your clarifying questions. We want to know what you're thinking in terms of uh, the work that we're sharing tonight. If you do have any problems, any technical problems with the session tonight, I wish there was a more complicated and sophisticated response, but oftentimes you simply need to close your window, log out, and come back in. Uh, as you can imagine, with Wi-Fi streaming connections all over the country tonight, uh, occasionally your Wi-Fi might break up, the audio, the audio might not work as well as you'd like, um, and if that's the case, then please uh, don't hesitate to do so. It will not interrupt anything that we're doing. So again, uh, you have joined us tonight for the Mythology of the Lost Cause. I'm joined by uh, Caroline Janney, uh, Professor of History of the American Civil War and Director of the Now Center for Civil War History at the University of Virginia. I'm also very pleased that Jeffrey Smith uh, is joining us as tonight's uh, teacher, uh, teaching assistant. Uh, Jeffrey is the co-chair of the Humanities Department and the Dean of Students at St. Andrews uh, Sewanee School in Sewanee, Tennessee. Uh, what Jeffrey's gonna be doing is dropping some questions and some links in the chat box that help you connect the content of tonight's session with the instructional design for your classroom. So, uh, Professor, uh, you're up in Charlottesville, not too far away from me. Can you hear me? I can, can you hear me? <laughs> sure can, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we're really pleased and looking forward to the conversation tonight. Uh, if it's okay with you, before I turn over the PowerPoint to you, I, I'd like to put you on the spot a little bit. And I'm gonna okay. do that by going back to the very first slide. Uh, you know, fun meme about, um, you know, this, this poor guy kind of walking up the, the sidewalk, that's the person who thinks they're doing history. And then you've got all these well-trained professional historians who are just waiting to ambush you. You must go through that, this a lot. I mean, what's, what's it like to be in, a, in an age right now where as an historian, there seems to be a whole lot of people with opinions that they think is, are just as evidence-based as yours? Well, that's true. And I would say it comes from, from two fronts. On one hand, I think that that there is we, we can be cynical as this meme is suggesting and that that people are on you know ki kind of using this without knowing on the other hand i think there's an unwittingness about it that that sometimes people think because they have access to whether it's wikipedia or, or any other google search that they have a sense of, of what it means to know something about the past and i i'd like to think that i'm a glass half full type of person 
And so yeah. I see this as an opportunity, especially with students in my classroom, to to give them a sense of history as a discipline, that it's right. not just what happened in the past, but how we understand it, and that that has changed over time, and that that is why, as I'm sure all of you well well know and recognize, that context is important. So context of what happened in the past, but also context in the, the sense of the, the historiography, the history that's being written, who are the historians that are writing? When are they writing? Are they writing during the Vietnam War, for example? And does that change mm -hmm. their perspective on war? So I, I'd like to think that, that yes, and I, as a Civil War historian, of, of course, there's always some, some people in the room that, that tend to know some little bitty aspect of the Civil War and want to explain that to me. But that's its own <laughs> set of challenges. But, but, but yes, I think we should see this as an opportunity rather than, than something that we have to, to wield our knives, as the, the name would suggest again. <laughs> well, uh, I also am a glass half full kind of person, and maybe these knives represent the, um, the early education of students with primary sources and evidence-based arguments. And what we'll there do is go. we'll slice through that disinformation. So we're looking forward to your talk tonight. Thank you again. Uh, I'm going to let you drive the PowerPoint and lead the talk. And again, as the moderator, what I'll do is bring questions to you when, uh, when the time seems right. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Andy. So I would just like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to attend tonight. Um, I will say I, I come from a family of educators. My mother was a second grade and fifth grade teacher. My sister-in-law is a English language learner specialist. So I so appreciate what all of you are doing in the classroom every single day. And, and please know, as a college professor, I appreciate what you've what you've done thus far. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the style for what I've done tonight. And that is because we are audio only with the slides, I have way more text than I would normally use in a classroom, but I wanted to give you a, a chance, uh, depending on the, the type of learner that you are, to, to jot things down, to see them in a couple of different ways. So there will be images that accompany, but also a, a good bit of text. And again, more than I would would normally use. But but let's jump right into it. And I want to start with what in the world is the lost cause? What do we mean? We, we've seen that term um, used quite a bit in the past couple of years. The short version is that it is an, a Confederate interpretation of the war or Confederate memory of the war. It is a version of the Civil War that casts the causes and meanings in the best possible light for the Confederacy. So painting the best picture for why the war happened and how the outcome played out. There are several tenets to the lost cause, and I will we'll go through those here for you. Some of them um, more important at different points, some of them more salient in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. Some become more pronounced by the time we get to the early 20th century. But just to go through them, they go something like this. Confederate soldiers fought honorably and bravely throughout the war. Confederates did not lose on the battlefield. Um, instead, they were overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed by superior Union material and manpower. There's a notion that Confederate leaders, most notably Robert E. Lee, and to a lesser extent, but, but still up there on the pedestal, Stonewall Jackson, were nearly godlike, that that Lee in particular was the epitome of a Southern gentleman. He was the, the ideal to which all Southern white men should aspire. There was a notion that white Southern women had been loyal and devoted throughout the war. And I would say perhaps the most important tenet, at least for the Confederate generation, for the men who fought the war, was that the war was a constitutional struggle to protect what they deemed as states' rights. In other words, they had not committed treason. As the 19th century went on, especially in the early 20th century, we see the other aspect of that argument, kind of the flip side of that argument, if you will, being that the war was absolutely not about slavery. But even though they denied the war was about slavery, former Confederates and increasingly white Southerners of the next generation argued that enslaved people had been happy 
they had been content, they had been loyal to their Confederate masters, to the Confederate nation as a whole, and this gives rise to the notion of the so-called faithful slave. And of course, I hope you heard the so-called in there. So if these are myths, if these are the best possible explanations for what the Confederacy stood for, for why it, why it fought, why it lost, where in the world does this come from? Well, let's look at some of the origins. I would encourage you to remember that the loss cause itself has a history. And this is where I'd, I'd like to, to pause and point out that in much of the, the current writing in, in um, regular media, social media, and otherwise, we seem to have this notion that the lost cause is static, that it's always been the same thing, and that is absolutely not the case. Like every other aspect of the past, it has a history in and of itself. So the lost cause was not only a post-war phenomenon. We can see evidence of it, of an explanation for these things in the war itself. We can literally see that explanation in one of the most famous paintings that came out of the war. This is Burial of Latine, painted by um, a man named, uh, last name of Washington, painted in 1864. And it is supposed to depict the funeral service of a cavalryman who died with Jeb Stuart's troops in 1862. And you'll note in this picture that it is women and, again, so-called faithful slaves who are mourning this Confederate soldier. So the notion that there were the faithful slaves and the loyal, devoted Confederate women on the home front is very much an aspect that we can see during the war. Another tenant of the lost cause that certainly has wartime roots was Robert E. Lee's reputation. Um, by 1863, certainly by 1864, he had become nearly infallible in the eyes of a great majority of Confederates. We also see him laying the groundwork for other aspects of the lost cause, most notably in his farewell address to his troops at Appomattox in General Orders No. 9, issued the day after the surrender, so on April 10, 1865. Um, if you look at the text, and we can talk about primary sources here, both the painting and Lee's order, he lauded the loyalty, the valor, the unsurpassed courage and fortitude of the brave survivors of so many hard-fought battles. So here we see those courageous Confederate soldiers. He assures his men that the surrender was through no fault of their own. Instead, he insisted that the army had been compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. So here's that aspect. Here's the notion that the Confederate Army didn't lose. They were simply overrun by all of those Union mercenaries. He also used the language of talking about, if you'll note it in that last paragraph, devotion to your country, to your country. This suggests that they weren't rebels. They hadn't committed treason. What's important to keep in mind here is that he issues this only a day after the surrender. The foremost Confederate hero sets forth several of the central tenets of the lost cause, and we can see this all right here in this primary source. So if Lee is one of the leading architects of the lost cause, who else might we say is responsible for this myth that, again, is going to ebb and flow and grow over the years. Well, in addition to Lee, we can point to those Confederate women, especially middle and upper class white women. They created ladies' memorial associations devoted exclusively to providing what they considered proper and Christian burials for Confederate soldiers in the aftermath of war. The National Cemetery System that you know today was exclusively created for loyal Union soldiers, and Confederate women felt like they needed to do something to honor the sacrifice of, of their men. Again, the lost cause progressing, changing over time, so women are at the forefront in part because they see themselves as apolitical. They say we can't be committing treason. We are, are simply mourning our lost fathers and sons and and brothers. Uh, keep in mind, most of these women weren't literally mourning their own fathers and sons and husbands. But as as um, the 
the decades pass, as Reconstruction comes to an end, we see former Confederate officers, uh, namely Jubal Early and others who are at the forefront of this, this burgeoning lost cause. By the time we get to the late 1880s, we can see the mass of enlisted men, of United Confederate Veterans Organizations that will form, that will see as their central purpose explaining why they fought and why they lost. And certainly beginning in 1894, we have the United Daughters of the Confederacy. They would become one of the most vocal groups, in many cases, literally the daughters of Confederate veterans. This is the next generation of women who are coming about who are going to be at the forefront of leading the lost cause. So what in the world is this all about? Why does a defeated people, why do they need to establish some sort of version of the past that is palatable? Why is it important for, their, for them to establish their history of the war? Well, I would say first and foremost, it is a need to vindicate, a need to explain to themselves and especially to their children and grandchildren. And I, I want you to pause and think about the degree to which memory is all about the next generation. It's always make, about making sure that we don't forget. We've seen this a lot, I think, in, in recent days in thinking about 9-11 and the 20th anniversary and not forgetting. That is language that was absolutely used by Confederate veterans and Union veterans, as we'll talk about. But they desperately needed their offspring to understand why they had fought. And even though this, this had failed, why, why had they done so? And I'll share with you some quotes here from a couple of different Confederates. Here we have Thomas Munford, who was a cavalry officer, which I will point out on a side note, refused to surrender at Appomattox in April of 65. When asked by a, a group of people why he was so adamant that Confederate veterans remember, he had this to say in part. What are they going to get out of it? To our children and their children's children, let it be our pride to teach them, as is done in every land where patriotism and self-sacrificing spirits are honored and esteemed, that the Confederates shed their blood for their mother Virginia, defending a cause she knew to be just and right. So again, their children and their children's children are important here. If their children were important, it was in part because of what Union veterans and their allies were doing. Here we can look at the words of George L. Christian, who was again a Confederate veteran, a very important person in the, the city council in Richmond. And he had this to say, the shrewd, calculating, and wealthy Northerners realized the importance of trying to impress the rising generation with the justice of their cause. And to that end, they soon flooded our schools with histories containing their version of the contest, laying the blame on the South. So textbooks, making sure that next generation knew what was going on. We, we see this at work here. So it's almost always about the next generation. They, they do this through a variety of ways. Uh, first and foremost, we see the establishment of Confederate Memorial Days which began only one year after the close of the war. And I'll point out, this is before Union veterans first started recognizing Memorial Day. That wouldn't begin until 1868. We also see registers of the dead, such as that for Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia, keeping an accounting of those men who had given their lives for the Confederacy. And of course, monuments. The earliest Confederate monuments were placed in cemeteries to honor the dead. But soon we start seeing monuments to so-called faithful slaves, such as that in Fort Mill, South Carolina in 1896. Think about what else is going on during this period, of course. This is Plessy versus Ferguson. In the 1890s, we have, by which I mean segregation, segregation becoming de jour, being written into, codified into the law, so the notion of the faithful slave of an of a African-American person who knew his or her place becomes increasingly important to white Southerners. 
So we start to see a different form of monument here. We also see those monuments to leaders um, probably in the, the past few weeks, certainly um, in the past uh, few years, perhaps none has received more attention than the Lee Monument in Richmond, Virginia, which was first planned in 1870 following Lee's death and dedicated in May of 1890. All of these are ways in which that they're trying to instill in the next generation, but there are other ways as well. For example, the Confederate Veteran was a magazine that began publication in 1893. This was a place where all of the organizations that were affiliated in some way with the Confederacy, whether that be the veterans themselves, the sons of Confederate veterans, or the United Daughters of the Confederacy, this becomes the monthly magazine where they would write articles. They talked about every monument dedication. They talked about movies that were coming out, such as Birth of a Nation. They, they talked about lynchings. They celebrated lynchings. They sold uniforms. They sold all sorts of, of kits, of, of flags, and other things. This is uh, one of the most popular magazines to circulate across the former Confederacy. But, of course, it was sold in other states, in every state of the Union as well. And finally, many of these groups did things like have essay contests or quizzes where they would make sure that young children knew something about the past. Textbooks, there was a fierce debate over this. The United Daughters of the Confederacy were absolutely instrumental in making sure that every Southern classroom had the so-called, if you could see me, you would see my, my air quotes, of the correct version of the past making sure that, that their version of what the war was about was, was that which young children were reading. Uh, United Daughters of the Confederacy, if they weren't members of school boards in the mid-20th century, their husbands were, and they had a voice in much of this. Professor? So, uh, sure, absolutely. I've got, a, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to bring to you, and this seems like a, a good time to insert these. Um, I don't want to get too far away from the early part of your talk. Um, the first question comes from Daniel. Uh, Daniel is joining us from uh, Lancaster uh, Catholic School in Pennsylvania, and he wonders, after reading um, the chapter that you assigned for tonight's webinar, uh, you point out in that chapter that white women had such a hard time recognizing the defeat of the South. Is there a specific reason for this, especially when you point out that many of the ex-Confederate men did accept it? Right. So I would say that we're talking about a specific group of white women, and mm. that is those of the middle and upper class, women whose status was absolutely dependent upon being slaveholders. And one of the things that is central to understanding about the so-called Southern lady is that the notion of the lady was dependent upon having enslaved labor to perform many of those tasks, those domestic tasks, to relieve her of that so that she could be a lady of leisure. And so this was something that, that many Confederate women, um, and, and this becomes even more pronounced with the UDC in the 1890s and on, that's something that they feel they've been robbed of. But So that, that's one aspect of it. A second aspect is the war itself was the first time that white women in the South had really engaged in the public sphere. Because so many of the reform efforts in the North that women participated in were intimately tied to abolition, it wasn't acceptable for white women in the South to be involved in, in organizations beyond that affiliated with their church for the most part. And so they really feel that they have, have found their niche, that they are lauded by Confederate men, they are uh, applauded for all of their sacrifices, and even Union men are shaming Union women for not sacrificing enough, for not being as devoted to their cause as it seems that Confederate women are. So I think those those factors together mean that that Confederate women, former Confederate women, and again we're, this, this is very class specific, feel like on one hand they they had this place during the war, they were valued for something, and and that's been taken away, or they're afraid of losing it. And on the other hand, they are worried about what their status is going to mean. Everything in the slaveholding South was wrapped up in slavery, every aspect of life in the South. And when you take that away, that, that not only affects 
the, the obvious things such such as, as labor, but even gender relations in the South. That's a great point. Thank you. Um, here's a question from Robert. Robert's joining us from the Bank Street School uh, in New York City. Uh, Robert asks, if the lost cause was established right after the war, why did presumably angry union veterans and their families, as well as subsequent federal and state administrations, not manage to subvert this narrative from taking hold through monuments and K-12 education, et cetera? Why, why, how did, why did the union not fight back? Ah, well, if it's okay with you, can I go to Please. the next slide? Because I think Absolutely. this will, will answer that well. That is Fantastic. a great setup. So uh, along the, the same lines, I think there's this notion that Confederates won the peace. There's an, an old adage that the Union may have won the war, but Confederates won the peace. And I think to Robert's point, Union veterans absolutely did fight back. They were absolutely adamant that they had been on the right side of history, that they had been on the right side of the moral weight. And they were trying to make sure that their version of the war, that their memory of the war was, was kept alive. They do so through many of the same means that Confederates will do, sometimes before former Confederates, sometimes following in their wake. So national cemeteries are established during the war and immediately thereafter, they are the impetus for those Confederate cemeteries that I mentioned. Memorial Days, again, began in 1868, so they are, are following behind Confederates. You might think of this as a call and response with different people doing different calls. Um, veterans organizations, the, the largest and most, um, not only most popular, but certainly the most um, politically influential of the veterans organizations was the Grand Army of the Republic, which organized in 1866. There were likewise women's organizations, um, much more numerous than their Confederate counterparts, but had less of a voice because Union veterans didn't believe that, that Union women were an essential part of the war in which Confederate veterans did. They were the first to build monuments. If you go to a place like Gettysburg or Shiloh or Vicksburg, you'll notice that they are primarily dotted with Union monuments no place more so than, than Gettysburg. That's what the, the top image is there. The regimental monuments that began in the 1880s that, that proliferated. Uh, Union veterans were fighting back. They, they were the ones who were in charge of, of textbooks in the, the former states of the loyal North. And they are angry. They are absolutely angry about Confederate veterans and, and, and their, their women's groups. There are a couple ways in which they, they try to silence them, um, specifically under the strictures of Reconstruction, when so-called radical Reconstruction or Congressional Reconstruction begins in 1867, and the states of the former Confederacy are divided into five military districts. In many, but not all, of those districts, there are, um, there are provisions that are passed. They're under martial law. And various generals, Sheridan is an example of this in, in Louisiana, will say there can be no celebration of Confederate, um, even the Confederate dead. There can be no Memorial Days. There will be no orphan societies for, for the orphans of Confederate um, veterans, so or Confederate soldiers, rather. So w we see some of that, but <laughs> there is the Constitution. And once these states are readmitted to the Union, there is something called the First Amendment that, that protects their rights to do some of these things. So once martial law is removed, this unfolds, and Union veterans will absolutely fight back. They will push back. So does, does that help, Andy? Yes, I think it does. And, uh, you know, again, it was a, a nice lead into the this part of your, your presentation and your talk, but I think it's, you know, I'm already seeing in the chat box, and I suspect that you you know, you address this kind of question quite often, which is, which is that sort of north versus south. That's that that ways that we respond to these, and I think that's a great uh, explanation you just gave. So I think one of the things that we so often forget is that we see the Confederate cause, this lost cause, and I'll come back to that when we get to because we're going to do a study march into the 20th century. But there's this notion that Union veterans were willing to forgive and forget, and mm. that is absolutely not the case. So we see this in, in all of these ways that, that I've laid out here. 
But then we have images like this. And this, for those of you that are familiar with the, the Ken Burns documentary, this is in the last episode. This comes from the 75th anniversary at Gettysburg in 1938. And I love to use this image in class because it's so often meant to show this reconciliation of the, the two sides coming together in peace and love. But all you need do is look at the expressions on these two men's faces. And they seem less than enthusiastic about being there. I'll point out that when I was in the archives looking at specifically at Gettysburg, at the reunions held there in 1913 and then again in 1938, the vast majority of images showed these men in their respective camps. So Union veterans with Union veterans, Confederate veterans with Confederate veterans, and they would come together for these photo ops. They would come together for these moments to show the, the so-called handshake, handshake over the, the bloody chasm. This is another famous one from the 1938. And I think too often historians and, and the larger public have suggested that Union is sold out to Confederates by embracing reconciliation, by shaking their hands. And we need to keep in mind the difference between reunion and reconciliation. Too often we conflate those two terms. So again, reunion versus reconciliation. Reunion was precisely the point that Union veterans fought for. This is what they wanted. They wanted a reunited United States, and many would increasingly add the end of slavery. So the triumph of reunion was the Union cause. And gestures of reconciliation served as evidence of a reunited nation. But this doesn't mean that they forgave Confederates. It doesn't mean that they believed that the Confederate cause was a worthy cause well into the 20th century, well into the 1930s, Union veterans are condemning their cause, the Confederate cause. They can say these men were brave. They were certainly brave when they charged across the field at Gettysburg in the picket Pettigrew charge. But what does that mean about Union soldiers? It means they were the, the better soldiers. They were even braver, and they, they won. So to acknowledge the bravery of the other side doesn't acknowledge the rightfulness and the justness of the cause. So we need to, to untangle these things just a bit. For their part, Confederate veterans could likewise come together and do this proverbial handshake across the bloody chasm, and they could favor reconciliation, albeit on their own terms, because reconciliationist sentiment helped convince former Confederates that they were back on equal footing in the Union. And the claims that they had fought against a worthy enemy only bolstered the notions that they, too, were honorable, courageous soldiers. So when we see pictures like this, again, we, we need to take some time and think about what all is going on in this picture. Veterans might be willing to commend their former foes for bravery, for courage, but neither side was willing to go so far as to concede that their own side had been wrong, that their own cause had been wrong. So these reconciliationist sentiments have their limits, and we need to be careful about not reading too much into them. Uh, one of my favorite quotes comes from um, Senator Edward Carey Walthall, who had been a Confederate general. He is, is serving in the Senate from Mississippi in 1895. And he has been asked to go to the dedication of the first national military park, which is a combination Chickamauga-Chattanooga National Military Park. So not Gettysburg, but Chickamauga-Chattanooga is the first national military park. And he's asked to go. And you can see here what he has to say, that he's in for a rather conspicuous part in the dedication, though he did his best to dodge it. And I love this line. I am a poor hand at blue-gray gush, but the occasion will acquire a little of that. So blue-gray gush, doesn't that sum up the fact that even though he goes, his heart is not in it? So this might be another example for your students of, of thinking about really interrogating what is going on. We see these things in the newspapers. We see things today um, on, on TV and news clips, but what's really 
the, the context? What, what's the background to that story? So obviously, Senator Walthall was less than enthusiastic about being part of this. He knows there is a pragmatic reason as a U.S. Senator for him to show up and say the right thing. That doesn't mean that he necessarily believed these things. That being the case, in part because of these reconciliationist efforts, by the 1920s and 1930s, it does sort of seem like the Confederate memory of the war had eclipsed that of the Union. And there are a variety of reasons for this. Um, perhaps um, the, the biggest reason is the, the work of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. They are dotting the landscape with, with monuments whether those be for common soldiers, which start to pop up in town squares and courthouse squares across the South. Uh, nearly every Southern community can claim a Confederate monument. I'll point out that the one there on your right is uh, one of the ones that is no longer there. That was in front of the Albemarle County here in Charlottesville Courthouse. That was, was removed earlier this summer. So common soldier monuments monuments to other public figures, such as Jefferson Davis. Again, early 1900s is when we really see this. And I want to use this, um, this chart that was created by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which has a lot going for it, but you might see my two little additions here. And that is if we look at the peaks in the naming of, of Confederate, so schools, for example, in the 1960s that are named after Confederate figures, or monuments themselves, they also correspond to anniversaries of the war. So we see a surge just before and during the 50th anniversary of the war, and then again in the 100th anniversary. There are, of course, other things going on during this period, specifically in the early 1900s. We see the height of Union and Confederate veterans in organizations, the height of Union and Confederate veterans in Congress, we start to see the um, height of Union Monument Building also in the early 1900s. Uh, we'll get to the 1960s in just a moment. So there's a variety of reasons for the timing here. But monuments are absolutely going up in the early 20th century. But we also see other ways in which former Confederates are, are now trying to make sure that the next generation remembers the creation of the Children of Confederacy in the early 1900s um, that included a catechism that children had to memorize and be able to, to um, re repeat on, on cue. Um, you can find evidence of this. There's some links I have at the end of the presentation for the Encyclopedia of Virginia, which includes an example of one of these UDC catechisms might be a, a great source to use in class. I now assign it in my Civil War memory class. Um, other ways in which former Confederates are, are really active in the early 20th century, fellowships for descendants of Confederates at universities across both the South and the North. The picture you see before you was or is, was at Vanderbilt University, Peabody College, which was absorbed by Vanderbilt. Um, there was a, a dorm called Confederate Memorial Hall, and this was specifically for the daughters of Confederate veterans. The word Confederate was removed in 2017 uh, amid, amid much controversy because Vanderbilt paid the UDC to remove the name. But it wasn't just at Southern schools. Columbia, the University of Pennsylvania, and Vassar all had scholarships for descendants of Confederate veterans. Uh, some of them had library programs where the UDC would donate library for a uh, Confederate literature, I should point out. So this, it's becoming national. Again, not just in the South. If we think about Columbia and Penn as universities that are encouraging fellowships for descendants of Confederates. And again, there is popular culture, perhaps one of the most understated ways in which the memory of the war becomes national. And None more so than Gone with the Wind. A birth of the Nation had started this in 1915, but with the publication of Mitchell's novel in 1936 and then her the debut of the movie in 1939, we see that the notion that the Confederacy was the Civil War. The very success of the Union cause 
seems to be fading away in the popular imagination. And we need only look at the symbols of each side to see in part how that played out. Uh, this may seem very, very obvious to you, but I want you to think about how the United States flag at the top doesn't look all that different. That's the, the, the flag from the war, so 36 stars. doesn't look that different from a, a United States flag with 50 stars. So the Union has continued to expand in size and scope, but the symbols of the Confederacy are suspended in time. And so we start to see this divergence, this notion that the Civil War was actually the Confederacy. But I need to emphasize yet again, for the first 50 years after Appomattox, Union veterans were absolutely determined that former Confederates would not write the narrative. And they refused to forget that there, there was a right cause and a wrong cause. Professor, uh, we've got a lot of questions that are queuing up. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to take just a, a short pause and answer some sure. of them. Um, let's start with a question from Andy in Chapel Hill. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, about landscape and about these physical expressions of memory that those of us who live in the South, uh, grew up in the South, walk around, walked around, all the time and you know things when you're with them all the time sometimes become invisible but they're still there we've got a lot of folks from all over the country in the session tonight a lot of folks on the west coast uh the midwest uh the north they they may or may not have the same kinds of confederate monuments that are that are in their environment um how is this not a regional story though why why does this matter on a larger scale if these kinds of landscapes are a little uh, somewhat localized well, there's a couple of different aspects that I would point out here. So on one hand, absolutely, former Confederates altered the landscape of the South when they not only created Confederate cemeteries and many of the places where battles were fought or where there were hospital complexes did create these these large Confederate cemeteries, uh, in addition to the, the National Union cemeteries. But that certainly permanently alters the landscape, becomes a visible reminder of the war and a, a clear reminder of the cause, especially when monuments start to go up in those cemeteries. But those monuments that are by, so that monuments don't go up in town squares, courthouse squares, more public places in the South until the, the 1890s and then really we, we see more of them in the early 1900s. But I should point out that, that for people in the, the Midwest or, or New England and the, the eastern portion of the country in the north, they too had lots of, of Union monuments. I, I taught at Purdue University for, for 12 years, and many of the surrounding counties, Delphi and other places, all had those common soldier monuments. So that landscape, I, I think you're, you're right, Andy, that it does become invisible in some ways if you're used to seeing it. If you're used to, to driving past the courthouse square and there's a monument and you don't think twice about what that monument represents. Um, it's certainly different in the, the far west, uh, the trans-Mississippi west. There aren't as many, although there certainly are. Confederate monuments. I had students in my memory class do a project a couple of years ago where they had to look for Confederate monuments outside of the former Confederate states. And trust me, there there were. Uh, many of them have been removed since that time, but, but those do exist. But it isn't just about the landscape, of course. It's the larger meaning that, that becomes part of that and those stories that become part of that. Confederate veterans, for example, are not just relegated to the former Confederate states. They and their descendants moved across the country, taking those stories with them. There were active chapters of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, the Confederate veterans in every state of the country in the early 20th century. So even though it might be centered in the former Confederate states, those stories and those campaigns, and certainly thinking about the textbook campaign and how that altered not just one generation, but several generations of students' understanding. Um, Karen Cox, who has written extensively about the United Daughters of the Confederacy, talks about how people like Strom Thurmond came of age reading those textbooks 
and were given a certain message about what the war was about. And, and with that, of course, um, ideas of, of white supremacy and race relations. And so these, these have long tentacles. It's, it's not just regionally based. It extends across the entire nation. That's such a great point that it's, um, you know, it's subversive. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's everywhere, whether it's, uh, you know, the General Lee and the Dukes of Hazard, or the stories, um, the myths that your grandfather may, may tell, or the textbooks or the street names or the sports uh, mascots, wh whatever it may be. But it, it really does become, you know, um, just a part of, of the life that is being led. That's a, a great way to describe it on this national landscape. Um, I've got a couple other questions I'd like to bring. Um, Professor Janie, and I apologize for saying Janie earlier. Uh, Professor, um, you can read this question in the middle of your screen. It's question 15. I'm going to read it for the audience. It's a little longer. This is from Kate. Kate's joining us from Boston Latin School in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, Kate wonders um, if you would say that if not union veterans, at least Congress caved to a certain extent with the Compromise of 1877 and the removal of the troops. And would you say that despite union veterans caring about preserving their version of the war in terms of fighting re for reunion, that the deeply ingrained anti-blackness that all whites held, combined with the fatigue from the micromanaging the South during the Reconstruction, contributed to somehow caving or tolerating this reconciliation narrative and made it somewhat inevitable, if not uh, useful. Wow, that is a wonderful and very complicated question, Kate. Thank you for asking that. So I will um, take it apart just a bit. And I will say that we need to keep in mind that the um, United States Congress in, whether we're talking 1865 or 1877, was um, not just ra radical Republicans, not just Republicans who wanted to change the racial dynamic in the South. Not only did you have Democrats who, if you look at 1864 elections at the, the county level, you will see that there were a significant number of Democrats in places like Indiana and Illinois and elsewhere who did not support many of the measures that would try to be uh, pushed through by Republicans in Congress. But you also have more moderate Republicans who are never on board with notions of racial equality. So ending slavery was one thing, but I would say that the vast majority, not only of Congress, but of white um, uh, citizens of the United States, white Northerners, were never on board in the, the mid-19th century with racial equality, um, maybe with um, political equality, maybe with voting, but not um, civic equality and other aspects. So we have to be careful of not reading back into the past our own values about equality. So I have a, a, a real problem sometimes with notions that there was a lost moment, that there were these moments um, when things really, um, I don't mean to say that, that things could have been inevitable, but I don't think there was a clear moment in time when the lost cause could have been absolutely smashed. If it was, it was the immediate aftermath of the war. 1877 is much too late. Uh, it's It's very much um, rolling along with steam by that point. So it really had to be that summer of 1865. There had to, in, in my, I, this will sound like self-promotion, I don't mean it this way, but I have a, a new book out that looks at the summer of 1865, trying to understand why uh, former Confederates marched away from the battlefield not feeling like they had been thoroughly subjugated. And I, I think that's part of it that they don't ever feel like they have been absolutely quashed and they don't ever feel like what they fought for was, was morally wrong. And with, without that, I don't think we could get to a place that, that we might like to see where this lost cause never developed. I think it was all kind of bound up in the way in which the war ended. Yeah, that's a great answer to complicate, um, you know, that, that whole notion. One more question, professor, and then we can move on. Um, Unfortunately, as a moderator, my job is to also be timekeeper, and I'll remind us we have about 35 minutes left. Um, so here's uh, the next question before we uh, resume your talk. This comes from Bonnie in Palo Alto. Uh, Bonnie is wondering if the propagation of the lost cause mythology 
happens in part because women's activities weren't classified as political. In other words, did the work of white Southern women give cover to pushing the lost cause cause mythology? Well, I certainly think so, Bonnie. Um, that's what I argue in the, the, the chapter that, that you had to read about the, or that you have the ability to read in the, um, in the, the resources about the Ladies Memorial Associations. I, I really believe that these women who organized in 1865, 1866, set this in motion under the guise of being apolitical. Of, of course they weren't apolitical. They might not have had the vote, but but they um, were absolutely making a statement in the services that they held at Memorial Day and the, the speakers that they chose who were pushing back against the early vestiges of, of Reconstruction. And they do so under the notion that they are, are just women who are mourning Mourning was seen as something that was feminine by nature. It was expected that that women there were, were certain um, protocols, everything from from mourning dress to stationery that that women, white women across the country were supposed to abide by. But absolutely, and and, and white Northerners saw through this, and they they called them on it. They said that these tributes to the dead were nothing more than ways of fomenting sectional um, tensions. So. Both sides knew what was going on, but yes, women are absolutely instrumental to the story. One of the, the really interesting things that we may or may not have time to discuss are the gender dynamics of the lost cause. And if you were tracking this, you would see that it's it's white women who come out at first and 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 after uh, you know after Lee has set in motion this idea about what the why the Confederacy lost. Women are the first protectors, and then the Confederate veterans come on the stage in the 1870s. They say basically, thank you, women. You've done a nice job. We can take it from here. And the, the women come back by the 1890s and say, um, no, we're the ones who managed to get that Lee monument put up in Richmond. We're the ones who managed to get everything done. We can fundraise, and so we'll take it from here. And starting in, I'd say the UDC really controls things through the, the, the 1950s, 1960s, but since the 1980s, it's the Sons of Confederate Veterans who tend to be the, the most vocal. You'll notice that the UDC doesn't say a lot today. It's the SCV doing things like reinterring uh, Nathaniel Bedford Forrest and having a, a service last week for his remains. So there, there's a, a gender cycle and gender dynamics that are going on here too. Thank you so much. Well, let's go ahead and with the the uh, last part of your talk, and then we'll uh, save some questions for the end. Sounds great. So let's move firmly into um, the mid 20th century and think about how the lost cause fared in the 1960s. 1960s, there is so much going on. I like to tell my students, and I probably should have put it on this slide, that we have the three C's of the 1960s. We have the Civil War Centennial. We have the Civil Rights Movement, and we have the Cold War. And talk about context, I suppose that could be our, our fourth C. Um, think about the way all of those three things then will play out in terms of the way in which the war was remembered. So gearing up for the 100th anniversary of the war, the United States created a national commission to celebrate, think about that term, to celebrate the war, uh, the National Commission was premised on the notion of reconciliation. So you can see before you a stamp that was produced by the United States Postal Service, um, medallions that are featuring both Lee and Grant using Lee's, I mean, excuse me, Grant's 1868 campaign slogan, Let Us Have Peace. So the, the National Commission was supposed to promote reconciliation, emancipation noticeably absent. No discussion of the war uh, about slavery or emancipation as a product of the war. This was limiting the discussion to the period between April of 1861 and April of 1864, chiefly focused on the bravery of both sides. But white Southerners realized that the war's memory, by which I mean the lost cause, could be used to address contemporary race issues, in particular the United States Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Board in 1954. 
and President Eisenhower's intervention during the Little Rock desegregation standoff in 1957 had convinced some white Southerners that the Civil War's memory might promote white unity as the region again came under what they saw as attack from federal intrusion. So we see, for example, that commemorating Jefferson Davis's inauguration that year in Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, the first capital of Confederacy, uh, a week-long historical pageant unfolded in 1961. This was also, of course, the site of the 1955-1956 bus boycott. But having this reenactment of Davis's inauguration offered a platform, quite literally in this case, on which to defend, quote, the Southern way of life. And just as a side note, when my students use that in class or in a paper, I always make them stop and define what do they mean by Southern way of life? They have to remember that there were more than white people living in the South. What is that code for? Anyway, white Southerners say that this is a way to promote solidarity among the region's white residents. Uh, the South, they said, was facing the same attacks, by which they mean the white South, as it had in 1961. Here's a newspaper from Montgomery. We, the people of a democracy, should stand up and fight as our forefathers did so we can lick this ever-present battle with the federal government as it continues to usurp rights delegated to the states. So very similar language to 19, from 1861. Not a surprise that in 1961, we start to see the Confederate battle flag raised in some states, here specifically South Carolina. Um, being raised above the state capitol. Yet, in the midst of the Civil Rights Movement, African Americans found themselves in a stronger position to contest the lost cause and other white-only interpretations of the war. Uh, just a couple of examples here. Um, black magazines, such as Jet or Ebony Magazine, published scores of articles not only about the failures of that National Commission, but also about the contribution of United States color troop soldiers. You can see that the middle of that, um, that, that cover there, the, the Negro in the Civil War. So lots of articles about this during this period. Also, I think we tend to forget that King's famous I Have a Dream speech in 1963 was specifically meant to commemorate the, the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, he alluded to the proclamation, reminding the crowd that 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. Uh, this is a great speech to use in a course to think about all the different layers, again, of the Civil War centennial, of the Cold War, and civil rights all together. So we, we are, we're starting to see some pushback from the African-American community. We're, st we are still seeing a solid lost cause. We're seeing reconciliation, not so much union cause in the, the mid part of the, the 20th century. But let's fast forward to the sesquicentennial, not too awful long ago, 2011 to 2015. Where's the lost cause during this? Well, I'll start with the fact that because there were a host of problems with the National Centennial Commission, uh, there was a concerted effort to avoid issues and to, to sidestep some of the, the lost cause issues. So there was no national commission created for the sesquicentennial. Instead, it was left to the National Park Service and to state commissions to plan, to honor, to commemorate the war. What we see in these state commissions, especially with Virginia and Tennessee, a much more concerted effort to discuss slavery. Slavery was central to all of the, the programming in those two states in particular, Extens extensive discussions of slavery as a cause of the war, the consequences of emancipation, the consequences and failures of reconstruction were all very much part of that story. But if we move away from the state commissions and look at what was happening on a local level, we see that the first two years so, and I'm going to include 2010 in this as well, 2010, 2011, we see more lost cause than we would in the years that followed. For example, Charleston held, held a secession ball in December of 2010 to celebrate the withdrawal from the Union. 
the uh, following year, February of 2011, crowds again gathered in Montgomery, Alabama to witness the Sons of Confederate Veterans reenact Davis's inauguration, an occasion that seemed eerily reminiscent of the 1961 affair. Central to this celebration, for example, was a procession of Confederate reenactors and women in hoop skirts that started the spot where enslaved people were once sold, marched past the place Rosa Parks had boarded a public bus in 1955, past the site of King's Selma to Montgomery March, and ending at the Capitol steps where Governor George Wallace had proclaimed segregation forever in 1963. The NAACP protested both of these events. But I want to point out these were not state-sponsored events. These were sponsored in large part by groups like the SCV. Other Southern politicians during the, these years rejected divisive attempts to celebrate the Confederate past. In February of 2011, for example, Mississippi Governor Haley Barber declined to sign a bill supported by the Sons of Confederate Veterans that would have placed Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, an antebellum slave trader, the first Grand Wizard of the Klan, on a license plate. And in February of 2013, Memphis voted to rename Civil War Parks, uh, change the name of Forest Park, and um, as you might well know, remove the, the, the monument to Forest there. 2015, though, 2015, we really start to see a change. And I think this is a moment we can point to as a popular catalyst for p pushing back against the lost cause. On June 17th of 2015, a white man opened fire on Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, killing nine parishioners. I'll show this photograph very quickly because I don't want to give him any more credit um, or any more publicity, rather, I should say, but uh, photographs soon surfaced of the perpetrator um, draped in Confederate battle flags spewing his white supremacist rhetoric. Not long after this, renewed calls for removing the flag from the South Carolina State House, accompanied by protests, quickly led uh, Governor Nikki Haley to lower the banner. But as you'll note, we start to see the language that is being used here. And as the, the state removed the flag, we are, are seeing um, um, gestures the notion that, that this woman is, is in mourning because the flag is coming down. And of course, her sign says, these lives matter, that, which is a direct corollary to Black Lives Matter. She has pictures of Confederates there on her flag. During the next two years, debates moved from just about Confederate flags to more specifically about Confederate monuments. In May of 17, Mayor Mitch Landrieu and the New Orleans City Council fulfilled a vote from two years prior to remove four Confederate monuments from the city streets. And in a very powerful speech, again, this is something else I assigned to my students, Landrieu gave voice to those who opposed the Confederate memorial landscape as, quote, an innocent remembrance of a benign history. Instead, he maintained, the monuments purposefully celebrate a fictional, sanitized Confederacy ignoring the death, ignoring the enslavement, and the terror that it actually stood for. Sounding a great deal like Union veterans of the late 19th century, he insisted, quote, it is self-evident that these men did not fight for the United States of America. They fought against it. They may have been warriors, but in this cause, they were not patriots. These monuments no longer represented the sentiments of most of the city's residents, he argued. And then there was Charlottesville. In February of 2017, the Charlottesville City Council voted to remove an equestrian statue to Lee, a decision that was promptly challenged in court. And then under the pretext of preventing the monument's removal, on August 11th and 12th, 2017, White nationalists and other right-wing groups gathered in Charlottesville, and the streets erupted. The protest turned deadly when one of the white supremacists drove a car into counter-protesters who had gathered to oppose the rally. Heather Heyer lay dead, as did two uh, state troopers. Numerous others very seriously injured. We, I think, tend to forget about them. But in the wake of this violence, 
the Confederate memorial landscape began to disappear. In the days and weeks that followed, other marble and stone centuries to the lost cause vanished in places like Baltimore, at the University of Texas, in Gainesville, Florida, in Durham, North Carolina, protesters toppled statues to Confederate soldiers, removed them. And then last year, as I'm sure you all remember, um, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, we started to see an even more extensive effort to remove uh, Confederate monuments. Um, here um, is the Lee Monument in Richmond, Virginia. It's a photograph that I took, dated there on June 11th, 2020, um, one of the most powerful um, things I can, can say I've seen to, to go and, and witness this. Um, I didn't get to see it illuminated, but illuminated, of course, changing the meaning. I, I think this is what, it, what is so powerful about monuments, that the people that put them up thought that they could stand uncontested, that they spoke for themselves, that they were so-called written in stone. And here we can see that meaning, that context has forever been changed. And of course, um, just recently on September 8th, the Lee Monument was removed. So the meaning of these monuments has changed, has forever been altered. The social, political, and cultural context of the moment shaping the way that we understand the past. And so I would, would wrap up a bit with this, that the notion of the lost cause that had been very much mainstream by the 1950s and 60s has become increasingly marginalized. Even as we have this discussion, uh, there are, are still very much parts and aspects of this to play. But I would say that the most important aspect to remember is that memory is about the present. Despite what people may say, memory is not really about the past. It's about the way we understand the moment that we live in, again, the social, the cultural, the political meaning that we imbue with the past. So understanding and, and conveying to our students that there is a difference between history and memory. History is what happened. Memory is the way that communities, individuals, and groups choose to think about the past for very specific reasons. So I will we'll wrap up there, hoping that leaves us enough time for, for questions. It certainly does. And I, I'm going to leave this slide up uh, as we get through these questions, because it's such a powerful reminder that all of our participants can take to their younger students. Um, Professor, I'm going to start by actually combining two questions. Uh, one comes from Allie. Allie's a good friend and colleague at the Bank Street School in New York City. Uh, Santiago, out in Los Angeles Unified, uh, is also submitted a question. And in both cases, They've asked if you could connect this, either the lost cause itself or just the, uh, the uh, sort of the practice of the lost cause, and if you can tie that at all into the big lie of the 2020 election and or the vaccine hesitancy. Do you see some connection between the ways that there's been backlash against both and this kind of uh, the, this mythology that's been created around either of those uh, issues? Yeah, those are, are great questions. I can say I I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post about the, the first question about the, the big lie. And I wrote that piece in late July of 2020, so before the election. And thinking about the ways in which we could see the, the former president already beginning to spin those tales, to weave that narrative of inevitable defeat that that he could not win and making parallels to the lost cause. I, I do want to warn against drawing direct parallels. I, I think what I see are many of the same tactics and much of the same rhetoric. And so they are two different things. The lost cause and the big lie are two very different things. The lost cause, especially in arguments about slavery, was, was grounded in the reality of 200 years of enslavement uh, sorry, um, yeah, 200 years of, of enslavement in this country and and a real um, political philosophy unlike the big lie, but many of, of the, the same means of going about perpetuating the myth, of, of trying to convince people um, that, that facts aren't facts, 
of sidelining those who don't agree with you. Uh, one example uh, from, from the Lost Cause, uh, Confederate General Longstreet, in the aftermath of the war, uh, became a Republican, supported Grant, and, and he uh, fought, literally fought, in Louisiana during the, um, a battle in, in um, New Orleans in the 1870s against white supremacists, and he was considered persona non grata among Confederate veterans. They then decided to blame him for Gettysburg. And so we, we saw some of that. We, we are continuing to see a lot of that with the former president of any Republican, for example, who did not agree with him of, of being um, maligned, of, of being uh, set aside as a traitor to the party. And I, I think in the terms of the vaccine hesitancy, also thinking about the, the differences between um, where people get their information and what they're willing to believe because it makes them feel better about their own decisions, I think that's where we can see parallels, not in the, um, the actuality of the, the lost cause and, and vaccine hesitancy, but the ways in which people are trying to manipulate the past for their political or the present for their, their political and, and social gains. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question comes from Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey is with us tonight as our TA. Jeffrey's in Sewanee, Tennessee. Uh, he wonders if, um, if you could speak to this question. What effect do you think that Lincoln's and the Union's view that the South had been in rebellion but had not formed a separate Confederate nation made a difference in the creation of the lost cause? That is a great question, and I don't know so much. I mean, maybe it does affect the creation of the lost cause. It certainly has legal implications. It has legal implications about whether or not you can prosecute these people. And so there's the notion of a dual status that the Confederacy was, and there, I, you know, we can cite court cases, the prize cases, and, and otherwise during the the war, that the notion that the Confederacy was simultaneously a, a belligerent nation that you had to respect the laws of prisoners of war, prisoners of exchange, but also that it was a, a, a rebellion. And so this created all sorts of legal, legal entanglements, and it made it very difficult as the war is wrapping up, following the surrenders at Appomattox and Durham Station, for decisions to be made about who could be prosecuted and who couldn't. If it is a belligerent nation that has been treated as such, you you can't try your enemy for for fighting. Um, you know we can't try a, um, a French soldier for fighting against us in a war um, if we respect them as a nation. And so there are all these legal entanglements that I think then do feed into the lost cause because the uh, amnesty and pardon proclamation that President Johnson issues in late May of 1865. Um, one of the things he does is he says that there's all of these most enlisted men, most enlisted Confederates, if, if they take an oath of allegiance to the United States, they will never be prosecuted. They can go home. They can go about them, their, their business. They are now citizens of the United States. But categories such as officers and people who owned more than $20,000 have to apply individually to Johnson. And if you read through the letters that they write uh, to, to you know every single one of them, says, the cause I fought for was the right cause, but I, I, I want amnesty, so I'll tell you that I want amnesty. They refuse to, to repent, in other words. So those legal questions are absolutely tied up in um, kind of giving former Confederates the sense, again, that they haven't been subjugated, that there is no real penalty for this experiment in in um, secession for this rebellion. Great, thank you. Um, this next question comes from Rashid. Rashid's joining us from the Ministry of Education in Morocco. And Rashid is wondering if you can speak a little bit about the ways that novelists and fiction uh, help support and enhance the lost cause. Um, in many, many ways. And there are, are so many examples that we could use the most prominent I have already referred to, and those were uh, Birth of a Nation, or The Klansman was the original title by Dixon before it became um, a film, 
and of course, Gone with the Wind. There are a host of others along the way, but both of those, I think, help make the lost cause a national story, making Confederate figures sympathetic, um, making the cause itself benign. And in the case of Gone with the Wind in particular, we don't see slavery as the cause of the war, but we do see um, enslaved people as happy and content, and life is so much better under um, under slavery than it is under the strictures, under uh, under Reconstruction. And we can see all these things that are unleashed once uh, slavery is removed. So there's this romanticized, notion that of, of the old south of the, the cavaliers and the, the beautiful women and i would say fiction plays an incredibly important role in perpetuating that myth certainly on a national level mm, great thank you this question comes from susan susan is in greensboro uh, she's wondering if you can speak some to the ways that dedication speeches give us some insight dedication speeches at monuments that is gives us some insights uh, to the position that that these dedications had to in the support of white supremacy. Yeah, mon monument dedication speeches are are the the greatest source. D it doesn't matter what the monument is. Find that the dedication speech, and you will will learn a lot about the people who constructed the monument, who who funded it, and what their values were. And so, in many instances. Um, in particular, with Confederate monuments in, in local places, but but even the, the prominent figures such as, as as Lee and Davis and others, if you look at the speeches, you will will see much more matter of factly discussions of white supremacy of Jim Crow than the monument itself might reveal. So those are a great resource for going to. Um, and I know this isn't what she asked about, but but we likewise see this if we look at dedications of Union monuments. We see the flip side. We see a condemning of the Confederate mm -hmm. cause, and we see lots of acknowledgement that in fact the war was about slavery. And and here is a another bit that is maybe beyond the scope of of what we're talking about tonight, but another myth that is created on the, the other side is that white Union veterans increasingly talk about emancipation and ending slavery as the century goes on, that becomes more important in their minds and their speeches as time goes on. And so they are exaggerating the extent to which they went to war to end slavery at the same time that, that former Confederates are, are doing quite the opposite. So speeches are a great resource. Mm, great. Um, you're mentioning these primary sources. We actually began tonight's session with with a, a short discussion about them. I'd like to take uh, Robert's question. Robert's joining us from New Jersey and reframe it a little bit. Um, you teach regularly, you teach kids who may have been in some of the classes of the participants that we are, are joined by tonight. Uh, you work with undergraduate students at UVA. Um, talk to us a little bit about the ways you use primary sources in your classes to explore these topics. So what do you find to be the most effective uh, strategies and, and uh, approaches? It's a, a great question, and it depends on the class, but I'll, I'll talk specifically about my Civil War um, class and my Civil War memory class. One of the things that I do in the Civil War class is have um, them read the, the articles, not just the articles of secession, but the speeches that were given in the secession debate, and Virginia offers a great example of this because of the three votes on secession, Virginia votes twice not to secede. And if you have students really dig into the, um, the the rationale, they start to see that even those who are saying, even even Virginians who are saying they want to stay in the Union are saying they want to stay in the Union to protect slavery. So in that particular instance, they take what their, their assumptions about why they, they want to stay in the Union. They think that if they're leaving, if they are pro-secession, then they must be pro-slavery, when in fact, they can be pro-union and pro-slavery. And so it allows them to, to dig deeper. And oftentimes, I find it is so much more effective to have them discover things on their own than me telling them. You know, it's one thing for me to, to stand up and lecture, but it's another for them to have those aha moments 
when they are, are digging into to a resource. Great, thank you. Uh, last uh, question I'd like to, to leave tonight's session with. Talk to us a little bit about the, the NOW Center for the Civil War. What do you guys do at, uh, at the center? And um, as, as the director, tell us a little bit about that work. Thank you for asking that question. So the center has several different audiences. We have our undergraduate students that we um, serve by, I, normally in non-pandemic times, we have a host of speakers coming through programming um, that, that they are part of, but we also have internships. Uh, many of them at National Park Service sites, paid internships during the summer. Uh, they work on our digital projects. We have two great digital uh, projects right now, That one on Black Virginians in Blue. So African-American men from, um, from Albemarle County in particular who, who fought for the Union Army, and another on UVA Unionists. So men who attended UVA or taught at UVA who remained loyal to the union. Our undergraduate students have been instrumental in doing the research for those projects, as have our graduate students. The center is, is really important for our, our graduate students, not only with those digital projects and bringing in people, but also because it allows us to have a community of uh, as many as a dozen different graduate students from their first year through their fifth and sixth year working on topics. We have seminars together. We uh, um, do, again, public programming for um, the larger um, community, both here in person, but also in, in recent um, months, we, we are reaching a national audience through our, our talks. Um, we have scholarships for um, graduate students and um, and professors elsewhere, and probably most important for this audience, starting next summer, next June, we are going to be having a week-long teacher seminar that um, the applications will go live soon, and we will have somewhere between 25 and 30 teachers that can come and spend the week with me and my predecessor, Gary Gallagher, learning all about the Civil War. And so this will be something that um, uh, fully funded for teachers out there, and I hope you will, will check out the NOW Center um, website. Stay tuned for more information on those applications. Uh, Professor, you can't see this, but there's actually a tab on the viewer's side that has some bio information about you and your work and a link to the NOW Center. So I'll point our participants to that if you're interested, but perhaps we can also share that information um, with our audience tonight uh, in follow-up email. Uh, Professor, thank you so much for joining us and helping to uh, to complicate and uncomplicate this topic. Uh, we really do appreciate your, your efforts and your contributions to humanities education. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I wanna thank uh, all of our participants for joining us tonight for uh, this webinar. Uh, please do follow the National Humanities Center and uh, our social media for announcements of upcoming events, both events at the center, but also with uh, friends and colleagues like Professor uh, Jamie. Um, we'd be happy to share that information. You can check out all the upcoming events through our website and our social media. That does include our next webinar. We've got a week until we spend another hour and a half together. I'll be joined on September 28th by uh, Professor of Law Eric Muller from University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, and the topic will be Japanese American citizenship in World War II, a study in color and black and white. Please have a great day at school tomorrow. Uh, I know it's been a, a stressful year so far, but I hope you can find uh, comfort in working with your students. Uh, you're doing a great job with them, and um, uh, we're, we're pleased that we can support you in those efforts. Uh, we'll see you next time at the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night, everyone. <laughs>